you know, there's a version of the Christmas story where there really? is a dragon. Really? Yeah. Why don't you sit up here and I'll read it to you. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Now listen up. Here we go. As I looked, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman came into view, clothed in the radiance of the sun, standing with the moon at her feet. She was crowned with a wreath of twelve stars. She was painfully pregnant, crying out in the agony of labor. Then a second sign appeared in heaven, ominous, foreboding. A great red dragon appeared with seven crowned heads and ten horns. The dragon's tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and hurled them toward the earth. Then the dragon crouched before the woman waiting to devour her child the moment it was born. And she gave birth to a male child who is destined to rule the nations with an iron scepter. Before the dragon could bite and devour her child, the child was carried away up to heaven, to God and his throne. In many ways, the Christmas story is a beautiful one. Or the cards uh, make it look beautiful anyways. Uh, the angels, the shepherds, the animals, the baby, of course. And this is a beautiful story. It's a joy-filled one, to be sure. It's more beautiful and more joyful than we often realize. But for all the moments of beauty that we see, <coughs> There are a dozen moments in the Christmas story that if we were there, we'd be terrified. Or if we had an understanding of what was going on behind the scenes, in the big picture, would blow our minds. Because things are not always as they seem. We'll see in our text over the next few weeks this very thing. The Christmas story is not quiet, cozy, Easy or beautiful, at least not in the sense that we all too easily get from the Christmas cards. It is a war, a battle. It is the war. We are, I believe, in danger of being lulled to sleep during the Christmas season. And not just because of all the turkey we ate. We're in danger of being lulled into a cozy, comfy Christmas, where we might actually be distracted from God's big picture and our part in it. The Christmas story, according to Revelation, reawakens our hearts. Listen to how Eugene Peterson writes about John's telling of the Christmas story in Revelation 12. He says this, It's St. John's spirit-appointed task to supplement the work of St. Matthew and St. Luke. Those are the gospel or the Christmas stories we're used to hearing. His is to supplement it so that the nativity cannot be sentimentalized into coziness, nor domesticated into worldliness. This is not the nativity story we grew up with, but it is the nativity story all the same. Jesus' birth excites more than wonder, it excites evil. Evil? Evil because the evil one knows what this birth and this boy will mean for him. Dustin Kenstrew, in his song, is Christmas Carol, This Is War. He gets it right. This is war like you ain't seen. The winter's long, it's cold. With hangdog hearts, we stood condemned. But the tide turns now at Bethlehem. He goes on, this is war on sin and death. The dark will take its final breath. It shakes the earth, confounds all plans, the mystery. Of God as man. We need this Christmas story. We need it to keep us awake to God's purposes in the world and our part in them. And that's actually why the book of Revelation was written. That's its primary task. 
You see, the, the book of Revelation was written in the late first century to help the church at that time, those who were facing suffering and persecution under the Roman emperor, emperor because of their commitment to Jesus as the world's true king. It's written to help these followers persevere even under immense pressure. But if we're going to see that, we're going to need to clear away some of the clutter so we can read Revelation responsibly. See, I realize that we often kind of ignore the book of Revelation because it's weird. <laughs> or at least it can be confusing. And, and we hear some interpretations of it that just make our minds go, I'm just going to leave that be. In fact, John Calvin, a great uh, theologian, biblical scholar, wrote commentaries on every book of the Bible, except one. He just didn't want to touch it. So if you're confused by it, you're among good company. Even the great John Calvin didn't want to touch this book sometimes. But we need this story. So here's a few things to keep in mind. First, if we're going to hear this text, or better see it for what it is, we need to know that it has a primary audience, and it's not you and me. It exists for us. We desperately need it. But it wasn't written to us. We always have to ask, like with every biblical text, what did the original author intend to communicate to the original audience? It has significance for us today. We need this text. It's for us. But it was directly meaningful to the first audience, to those first Christians who heard it and used it in their worship services. Uh, Catherine and I got to backpack around Turkey in uh, the country of Turkey in 2009. And we got to visit many of the ancient cities and sites where, where, where this text was addressed to. And things began to click for us. From the geography to understanding the socio-political dynamics at the time. To beginning to see part of what was happening in the religious structures at the time as well. See, during that time, the emperor Domitian, uh, he demanded that the subjects of his kingdom would worship him. In fact, we, we got to see this in the Ephesus Museum. That's a, a very big statue. That arm, I'm not as tall as his arm is there in that statue, was set up in the city of Ephesus. There would be altars around the city with little dips in them. And these would be places where it was more or less required that you would burn incense or some sort of offering on a regular basis to the emperor. And the Christian church at that time who came to see Jesus as the only one worthy of worship, the world's true king, they stopped participating. People noticed. And there began to be pressure on why are you participating in these, these give us cohesion as a community. Further, there would be parties during the Greco-Roman world where you would establish your kind of community connections for business. They didn't have LinkedIn, I guess. And, um, and so you go to these parties, eat excessively, drink excessively, and sleep with people that you didn't know. That was normal life. And the Christians, of course, said this is not normal for those who are part of the kingdom of God. And they begin to back away from uh, the patterns of life that are going on around them, and people notice. And so they're facing this persecution. They're beginning to be a marginalized community because of their faith in Jesus. And so John, the writer, who has been exiled to the island of Patmos, just off the coast from where Ephesus is, he's writing to encourage these Christians who are under pressure. Some of them are beginning to lose their lives for their commitment to Jesus, and he needs to invite them and encourage them to maintain their commitment to Christ. So above all else, Revelation is a discipleship manual. And that's the role it primarily has for us today as well. Daryl Johnson, in his book on Revelation, tells a story uh, of some seminary students, people doing their grad studies and studying Bible and theology, and they're playing basketball, and they're just finishing up, and they're talking about their course of Revelation, how everyone doesn't understand this book. They're just struggling to kind of wrap their head around it. The janitor you know, pushes broom around, and, and he's overhearing this discussion, and um, he says, I know what it means. <laughs> really? Go on, then. You know what the book of Revelation is about? God wins. Two words. If you struggle to understand the book of Revelation, that's its central message. God wins. But we live in a world where it doesn't always look like it, right? 
It certainly doesn't feel like it, but that is what's true. Evil will not have the last word, God does, and that's why this book is written. It tells us the truth of God's victory over evil and sin and death, and the truth of our destiny for all who trust in King Jesus. It tells us what's wrong with the world and God's solution to it. It tells us what time it is. That Jesus has already won the great battle, and yet we're still awaiting his second coming as king, and so we need to persevere in the meantime. In fact, Revelation 12 is often considered by scholars the center of the book. It's the theological center, the axis around which the whole rest of the book circles. Why? Here's why. Because the claim of the gospel, that Jesus, God the Son, has come to earth, that through his life, death, and resurrection, he vanquishes evil, that, that God has won, he's been victorious, because the central claim of the gospel, we wonder, is it true? If, if it's true, why is there still so much evil in the world? Why does evil still wreak, wreak havoc in our communities? Like, how many shootings do we need to see in the news right now? Not just abroad, but locally, too. If the gospel is true, why so much evil still? Revelation 12 begins to answer that question for us. This book is a discipleship manual. It shows us how to follow Jesus while under pressure. But notice how the book does it. The name Revelation is from the Greek word apocalypsis. And that means to make known or to reveal. Another good way to translate it would be to, to pull back the curtains. It, it pulls back the curtains to show us the behind the scenes. That there is more to this world than just what meets the eye. That there is a spiritual reality that's going on in the heavenlies. More than meets the eye is happening. Oh, it does reveal some things about the future too. It claims to and it does that. But that's not the main point. And if we make it the main point, we will be distracted from most of what it's arguing. And that raises the other thing that we need to see here. The way time works in this book can make it a bit tricky. The question we should not be asking is, what happens next in history? As though this is a crystal ball describing a step-by-step -step chronological roadmap to the end of the world. The images, the signs, the numbers, I think, they are more or less understandable and directly applicable to the first century Christians who would read this in their worship services. It's a discipleship manual for the church under pressure. The question we need to ask in terms of chronology is this. It's, it's not what happens next, but what does John see next? Scholars agree Revelation 11 could have been the end of the book because it describes the end of the end. But John still has more work to do. He still has to take us then back again one more time through to show us why does evil still seem to be present? Why is it still at work around us? One last thing we need to see. The text has imagery, bizarre, grotesque sounding actually it might seem. That can't be reduced down to a so-called proper form of propositions. Think of a picture in an art gallery. The picture itself is its own text. You couldn't just read, see the little write-up on the side there? You can't replace the piece of art, put it to the side and just put up the explanation. The explanation can never replace the thing itself. Art is its own text. And when we read the book of Revelation, our, our goal as readers is to hear it, to see it, to let it work on our imaginations. We are going to be explaining the text. For these symbols and numbers, they mean something. But we can't let that take away from, we're not trying to pave over it and make it into flat propositional truths. No. We need to, to let the wildness of this imagery work on our hearts and our minds and our imaginations. And so that's what we're going to do over these next weeks. We'll talk about what it means. But just let the text do its work on you as well. If it disrupts your view of a cozy Christmas, praise the Lord. That's its goal. So let's let it do its goal. Pray with me. God, we thank you that you inspired John to write this text down. And you gave him these visions so that the early church and the church today and throughout the centuries 
could know the central message of the gospel that God ultimately wins through Jesus the Son, even if it doesn't look like it right now. Fill us with confidence. Speak to our hearts now as we read in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read Revelation 12 for you, but instead of putting up the text on the screen, I want you to picture it. Listen, but look as well. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. Look, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now. Have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens. And you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea. Because the devil has gone down to you, he is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. Then the dragon saw that he, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. This may not be the nativity story you recognize, but it is the nativity story. John gives us a backstage pass, you might say, to the concert. To get to see what's happening behind the scenes. To get to look in on it from a different angle, and it's an angle we need. This week, we're going to focus in on just the three main actors, but we'll have three times to go through this, and we're going to see some other elements as we go. Um, some of you know that I have a bit of a problem. Ah, and it goes like this. I'll meet you in the lobby, and we'll chat for a bit, and I'll have got your name. And then uh, it'll go something like this. Man, Janice, it was so nice to meet you today. Thank you. know, that is great. I hope to see you next week. It's kind of like, well, <clears throat> sorry, the name's Jim. Uh, it's not that bad, but close. I sometimes wish we had just big name tags. So everybody knows who everybody is, and that's part of the problem with reading the book of Revelation, is that you're reading and you go, okay, well, who is this? Who is it talking about? We wish there was name tags, and fortunately, John has dropped a few name tags into this story. We'll look at each. First woman, who is this? A great sign appeared in heaven. That's important. What do signs do? If you're driving along the highway, what, what is a sign all about? It's pointing. 
It's pointing to a reality beyond itself. The sign isn't the thing itself, and I know that because those big A and W burger signs on the way from Chase, you know, it's before Chase. The burger is not the thing. My kids wish that the burger was the thing, but it is not. It's a sign. It's something that points beyond itself to another reality. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed the sun with the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. This is a sign, John says. Don't look for a woman dressed in the sun. You're not going to find her. Where does the sign point us? This might frustrate us a little bit. We who like kind of straightforward, single, simple answers. Her identity is multi-layered. Let me show you how. We have to look in a few directions. First, we look back into the Old Testament, and we say, have we ever heard language like this before? John is filled with echoes of the Old Testament. If you don't know the Old Testament, you will not understand the book of Revelation, because he's drawing on it constantly, and he's drawing on it here, too. We read in Genesis 37. You remember the story of, of Joseph? Yes, the one where the Broadway musical was made out of Technicolor Dreamcoat? That guy. Okay. Joseph is given these dreams by God. One of his dreams goes like this. Listen, he said to his brothers, which maybe wasn't a good idea, but he said it anyways. Listen, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Sun, moon, 11 stars? Well, it sounds close, but where's the 12th star? The 12th star is Joseph. Uh, the number 12, all throughout the, the, the storyline of the Bible, is the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, later known as Israel, the son. Rachel, mother, the moon. 12 stars are the 12 tribes of Israel. Who is the woman in the story? The woman is Israel. It's God's people. And that makes sense. In Isaiah, we read about how Israel is, is, is like pregnant, waiting to give birth to the Messiah. We know that the promise given to Abram uh, way back in Genesis 12 says that, uh, that through you, all nations will be blessed. It's through the people of Israel that the Messiah would come. So it makes sense that if there's the birth of the Messiah would come through who? The people of Israel. So the woman is Israel, but more. In Luke's gospel, we hear about Mary and Elizabeth and Zechariah and Anna. Simeon, all of these figures, right, in the very first two chapters of the book of Luke are representative of Israel. They are faithful Israel awaiting the coming of the Messiah. They show us what that waitingness looks like. And we read that this woman gives birth to a son, a male child. If this is not figurative. Who is the woman who has the dragon waiting to devour her child? It's Mary. But more still, uh, John understands that the people of God include all those who trust in Jesus and have put their trust in him. So who, uh, we find out in verse 17 that, um, that this woman has more children. And, and part of the, the children of this woman are those who keep God's command and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. The woman is the church. The ancient church and you and I today and all those followers of Jesus across the globe and throughout history. The woman is the people of God, Old and New Testament. The woman is Mary. More on that in part two of our series. And it turns out that there's actually only one command in this whole chapter. There's a lot of implications, things this means for us, but there's only one thing that we have to do. The, the command, it's Maybe kind of frustrating to us too. Not all of our translations uh, translate this word, but it's, it's look or behold. It comes up in verse 3 of our text. And so let's listen to this word. Then another sign appeared in heaven. Look. <clears throat> Pay attention. Notice. Behold. Look. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. Again, 
John tells us this is a sign. John is saying, don't look for a literal red dragon somewhere. You're not going to find him. So how does he describe this creature? The dragon is red. It's the color of blood. It's a symbolic of, of death. I mean, this sucker is mean. And ugly. Seven heads sure is ugly. But more to the point, in Jewish understanding, the number seven means completeness. And heads means authority. He has influence. But note this, his influence is limited. Only what God has given him, and it's only limited to the time when we read that in the text. Praise the Lord for that. It says he has ten horns. Horns in the Bible means strength. He is mighty. And he has seven crowns. Crowns are a sign of wealth. Here's what one scholar says. This dude is very rich. His influence is symbolized by his capacity to sweep away one-third of the stars with his tail. And, as John will tell us, the identity of the dragon is someone we've already met in the storyline of the Bible. Verse 9 says, the great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Yes, we've met this character before. Dragon stood in front of the woman that he might devour her child. The Christmas story is more wonderful and more gruesome than we usually want to even begin to believe. It really is war. The evil we see in this world has an evil one. Capital E. Standing behind it. Just think of the Christmas story in Matthew's Gospel. The Magi, the three kings from the east, see a star in the sky and they go to find this child to worship the baby. And they show up in Jerusalem and they ask King Herod, Herod, so where is the newborn king? And he's like, what newborn king? Who's this now? Uh, well, yeah, we've come to worship him. We saw a star. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know where he'll be born. So he asks the biblical scholars in his midst, and they search the scriptures, and they say, well, it's actually Bethlehem. So Herod tells them, well, why don't you go? And when you find the baby, come and tell me where he is, and I'll, uh, I'll come and worship you too. Yeah, right. So they get there. The magi, they find the baby, they worship him, they offer their gifts to this child, but then they're warned in a dream. Take a different route home. Don't go back to Herod. So they do. They take a different route. And Joseph is warned as well with Mary. Take the mother and the child and get out of Dodge. Why? Herod's trying to kill the child. That dragon crouching before the woman is the capital E that stands behind what Herod's out to here. Christmas indeed not only excites wonder, but evil. And we see incredible evil in that story. Herod commands that all the male children, two years and under, in the vicinity of Bethlehem be slaughtered. There is a massacre of the innocent. That is the Christmas story as well. This is war on sin and death. There is evil that stands behind the evil that we see in this world. And this tells us who that is. The dragon is the ancient serpent we read about in Genesis 3. See, not only have we heard echoes of the characters before, we have actually heard this story in some ways before, too. In the opening scene of the Bible, in, in Genesis 3, we read how humanity has this, this whole relationship with God. The man and woman are in the garden. Their relationship is completely at peace with God and each other, with their own selves, with the rest of creation. But then this conversation takes place between the serpent and the woman. In the story, it says that the woman is deceived. She believes the lies of the snake. God doesn't really love you. God doesn't really want the best for you. God's trying to keep you in the dark. You need to be your own God. You need to set your own rules. You need to take life into your own hands, right? And she and the man begin to nod along. And they take the poison of that lie into their hearts and live it out. And so do we. Be your own gods. Okay. They take it in their hearts. In that ancient story, God is not done with the humans he creates. He plans to rescue, to win us 
back. And so he makes a promise to the serpent. He says this in 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he will crush her head. He'll strike his heel. Does that sound familiar? We've got a story with a woman, a serpent, and a child. We're hearing this story again in Revelation 12. That's the story that's getting lived out now in the Christmas season. Merry Christmas. <laughs> the dragon is crouching in front of the woman, seeking to devour the child. But does he? No. The descendant of this woman. A human person. Jesus comes in flesh and blood as a human. Crushes the serpent's head. The dragon does not get what he wants. Look at what John shows us next. And note as I read what he doesn't say. This is important. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nation with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Did you catch it? The woman is a sign. The dragon is a sign. The child is not. The woman points to a reality beyond herself. The dragon points to a reality beyond herself. The child is the reality. We do need to look for a literal child. And we know exactly who this is because John says his name, essentially, in this text. Um, he quotes directly from Psalm 2, verse 9. This is a messianic psalm. It's the most quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament. And it's always about how Jesus is fulfilling the long-awaited hope of Israel. He is the king who comes. We look and we see the woman. We look and we see the dragon, both signs of other things. But then we look at the child and the child is the reality. And as we read, the, ch the dragon does not get what the dragon wants. Her child was snatched up to God and his throne. This section might seem odd to us. It seems like it goes right from the Christmas story to Jesus' ascension. Kind of skips the middle of his life. But you know what? The Apostle Paul also focuses on an element of the gospel like this as well. In 1 Timothy 3.16, he wants to focus on a distinct element of the gospel, and so he does. Here's what Paul writes. He appeared in the flesh. Ah, that's the Christmas story. Got that. Was... Vindicated by the Spirit. Boy, this is after his resurrection already. Was seen by the angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Yes, we are forgiven through Jesus' death and resurrection. Through the cross, that's the way in. True that. All of that. Paul believes it. And yet he's able to focus on a different element of the gospel too. What is that? This child was born through. Jesus is king. He's the rightful king of heaven and earth, and he's my rightful king, and he's your rightful king. And so that begs the question for us. Is he? Is he your loving leader? Does the way I walk in the world show that I'm following Jesus and his ways? Is he my king, or am I following the voice of someone else? This text raises that question for us and begs us again to make room in our hearts that King Jesus would be king in our lives. But there's more too. This tells us that this is no ordinary child. It, it is. This child is a real human person. Not a sign. The child is a reality. But this child actually shares God's throne. How can a human share the throne of God? Only if the human is also, at the same time of being human, fully God at the same time. And that is the mystery of the incarnation. That Jesus is fully God and fully man all at once. Yes, Jesus can be the world's true king because he is God with skin on him. And still more, we have to see this, God is sovereign. He ensures the ultimate destiny for his son. This is important. This should fill us with incredible confidence. See, like John's first audience, we know that Jesus goes through the cross before he's raised from the dead and given a home with God 
in his throne. He has to go through the cross. Same is true for us. The victory comes through the cross, but that's not the end of the story. We read in verse 11, this beautiful declaration that resounds from the heavens, speaks of God's own people who have trusted Jesus. This is what it says. They triumphed over him, the dragon. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. We might be tempted to skip over that last part. To not think about the fact that they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. These are people that lost their lives because of their commitment to Jesus. No other reason. They said, I'll follow Jesus. And the empire says, okay, here's my sword. It's peaking about Christian martyrs here. They did not love their lives so much to shrink from death. How could they do that? Because of the confidence they have knowing that Jesus the King was redeemed, restored, well, not redeemed, but brought back to the Father through the Father's power. And the same will be true for us too. We can follow Jesus because we're insured of life after this life for those who have trusted him. Evil does not win it. Jesus does. The child really does crush the serpent's head. And now remember, the only direct command in this whole text is look. See what's happening here. So we do. In the song, Before the Throne of God Above, we sing these words. When Satan tempts me to despair, it tells me of the guilt within. Because let's be honest, there is guilt within. There is a week that goes by that I, in some ways, haven't stepped out where, where the way of Jesus is this one. And I said, no, no, I'm going to take a different way. In some way, there's not a day that goes by that I don't need to pray what Jesus taught me to pray. Forgive me. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Why? <coughs> Satan tempts me to despair, tells me the guilt within because there really is guilt within. Sometimes he falsely accuses us, but usually it's just totally <coughs> legitimate. Dave, why would God want to keep using you? Look at how many times you screwed up. Can you really be a leader of God's people? Look at your life. Tempts me to despair. That's why we need to keep preaching the gospel to our hearts. Keep hearing this text to our hearts. Because there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, we may blow it, and we will. But we can come back to Jesus who forgives us. Upward I look to see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free for God the just. He satisfied the book on him. Pardon me. Is that the freedom that you're living in? Because that's the freedom Jesus gives us. That's the freedom I need. That's the freedom the table invites us to know again. I'm going to invite those who are going to serve with me to come to the table now. I want to take it all in. We hear it in, in verses 9 to 11. We read these words. That Satan is hurled down, hurled down, hurled down. Look at how many times it shows up there. John loves preaching the gospel to us. And it's this. Evil does not win. The evil one has come under the power of what Jesus has done. We are free. Really free. So John is preaching the gospel to our hearts again. And we need to hear it. And the table reminds us that the child we read about is also the lamb whose body was broken, whose blood was poured out so that we can be free, counted free. And this means that evil can be defeated in our hearts right here and now. So what Charles Wesley in his Christmas hymn, Hark the Herald, he invites us to sing and pray these words, come, desire of nations, speaking of Jesus, come. Fix in us thy humble home. Rise, the woman's concrete seed, and bruise in us the serpent's head. Jesus, come, and every time the enemy tries to tell me that I'm unworthy to come before God, crush his head again, because I know that's not true. The gospel speaks a different word over us, one that says he has conquered, 
And then we can try through the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. It says, come and bruise the serpent's head in me when I'm tempted to take a different way than the Jesus way. I try to get my way through force or manipulation. Oh, come and bruise the serpent's head in me, Lord. Brings us to pray as Jesus taught us to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yes, Lord, deliver us from the evil one because there is an enemy of our souls. Who wants more than anything to destroy the child and the woman and the work the child has asked the woman to do in the world wants to destroy us. But we have an advocate for us. The one who stands before the throne and says they're not guilty because I paid them. As we come to the table, Jesus tells us to remember him. This is for all those who call Jesus their loving Lord, who have accepted what he's done on the cross for them. If that's you, you're free to take this. If it's not you, why not today? Put your trust in him. Evil is conquered. It will not prevail. Jesus has won the victory. So come to him. Let's pray. Jesus, on that night that you were betrayed, that it looked like evil was honestly winning, you said, it's not. Because my body will break, but I'm going to heal the world through it. My blood will be poured out, but that will bring forgiveness. So Jesus, we come now to the table to remember that what you've done is complete. No more sacrifices necessary. We are free to come to you. We give you thanks, Lord.